Thank you so much. My name is Eduardo Torrealba, and I'm here to talk to you about PlantLink, or uh, how I learned to stop planning everything and just start building things. I'm especially excited to be here at Eureka Fest because it's a very similar event to where I got started as an engineer. Uh, when I was in high school, during the year after my junior year of uh, high school, I participated in a program that was run by NASA uh, that was part of Johnson Space Center's High School Aerospace Scholars. During the week of that summer that I was down there, I, uh, there we go, great. So uh, I, I spent a lot of time working on engineering design challenges, uh, building things, learning about engineering principles, a lot of similar things to what you'll be doing for the next few days. And I learned that I was really interested in engineering and that that was what I wanted to do with my life. And so then I entered college the next year and uh, declared mechanical engineering and started getting the skills that I needed to work at a place like NASA someday. And everything was going great and going according to plan until I had a lunch that changed my life. I was down in Honduras during the summer after my junior year of college uh, when I was working on a lot of different hydroelectric systems for some of the villages there. We were installing these systems in places that had never had electricity before, and it was a lot of really hard work to put these things in. Uh, and then one day during some of our downtime, we went and had a lunch at a restaurant that was in the town near the village that we were working in, and I ended up eating that plate of food uh, and I won't go into too many details, but there was a piece of chicken there that was pretty gnarly. And it ended up giving me food poisoning that was worse than anything I'd ever experienced to that point or since then. And as I was laying down in a bed for the next 24 hours thinking about how sick I was, I couldn't help but think about the Hondurans that I'd been working with for the past week and the fact that they didn't have the luxury of taking a day off when they got sick from eating contaminated food or water or not having enough to, uh, to eat or drink. And I thought about how they have to work so hard every single day to just survive. And so I knew that I wanted to take my engineering skills and apply that to this problem and design systems and technologies that would make life easier than ever before for these people. So I decided to pursue a PhD in mechanical engineering because I wanted to get even more education and understanding of these problems before I tried to launch something on my own. But a funny thing happened while I was getting my master's degree. I kind of got off track. Instead of focusing on the research that I was supposed to be doing with hydrophobic surfaces, I ended up just thinking about these problems in the developing world all the time. And every time there would be a problem in my own life, I would think about how that would relate back to the people that I met in Honduras. And so the day that my wife's basil plant started dying and we realized that we weren't watering it correctly, I immediately thought of the farmers in Honduras that we had been working with and how they needed the water resources uh, to be more effectively managed so that they could grow those crops. So I started building a version of a system that would allow me to check and uh, see whenever I needed to water my plants, send me automatic alerts, and even water the plant for me if I was away. So after building a basic version of that, I got together a few friends and we started prototyping even more versions. We decided to start a company. So we built lots of versions of PlantLink for the next year. And during that time, we had a lot of failures, but we had a few successes along the way too. And we finally got to the point where we felt like we were gonna be able to build something that other people would be interested in purchasing. And then we did something that was really scary. We launched a Kickstarter campaign. And in that Kickstarter campaign, we really didn't, didn't know what was gonna happen. Were we gonna be a success or a failure? It was really hard to say. But we knew that if we were a success, it would be the confirmation we needed to keep going. But the scary thing was if we were a failure, thousands of people would see that we tried and they would see that we failed and we probably wouldn't want to keep going with it. I'm happy to say that we were a success on Kickstarter and that gave us the impetus that we needed to keep moving forward. Some of us are stopping grad school for a little while to focus on the product. And we're really excited about the future of PlantLink, both for people here in the United States and for people around the world who need to manage water resources. Now at this point, you're probably thinking, so what? That's nice, Eduardo. Good job, congrats on the award. But what does this have to do with me? I'm different than you, you know, you're a unique person. And you're right about that, but I'm not that unique. I'm just uniquely average. When I was in grade school, I tested three math levels below where I needed to be. And then I had pretty mediocre grades throughout high school. I really wasn't that passionate about very many things. And by the time I realized that I wanted to be an engineer, it was too late for me to build that resume that I really needed to get into prestigious schools. So I ended up getting waitlisted at the only one I applied to. And then when I was in college, I was at a pretty good school, not a great school, um, but you know, I was never in the top of my class there either. And I would apply for internships and I would be in the top 20, but there would only be 18 spots. And so things didn't really go according to plan sometimes. And I don't say that to complain or to you know, be upset about what happened, but I say that to say, you don't have to be extraordinarily different to be an inventor. You just have to have the right set of habits and mindsets to put yourself in a position to be more innovative to solve these problems. 
So for the rest of this presentation, I'd like to talk to you about four things that I've been doing in the last few years that have made me a much more innovative person. The first one is embracing distractions. And when I say distractions, I don't mean playing computer games or going on the internet or watching TV. I'm talking about those distracting problems that pop up in your life that stop you in your tracks and make you really frustrated. The things you complain about on Facebook. You say, you know, why is this this way? This is so annoying. And that would happen to me all the time when I was in college. But I would tell myself, no, I'm too busy. I don't have time for that. I can't you know, spend time solving that problem right now. I have to get this assignment done. So it's funny that by the time I got to grad school and I was busier than ever before, I finally started looking at those things that would pop up in everyday life, and I started thinking about the way that I could solve those problems. And when I say I'm busy, I mean that my schedule starts at 6.30 a.m. and goes until 9 or 10 p.m. every day, and that's just the stuff on the calendar. There's more that happens after that. And so if you think you're too busy, I'm busier than you are, so you don't have any excuses. Next, once you've started thinking about those distractions, you have to find a co-conspirator. These co-conspirators are the people that you're gonna sit down and talk to about your ideas. You're gonna say, I've run into this problem and I've got this solution, what do you think about that? And these need to be the kind of people who can say, you and you're on the right track, that's really interesting, let's keep going with that. But more importantly, they need to be the people that can say, what are you thinking, that's crazy, don't do that. And once you've been working on different problems with these people, you can start finding the ones that you know you wanna work with in the future. And these are the people that you'll wanna to get together with so you can start building the solutions to these problems. But you can't just build any solution. You have to start by building a really crappy solution. You have to get together and grab some wire and some string and some glue and some popsicle sticks and put together a prototype that might not even work the way that you want your invention to function, but it's gonna show some of the functionality. And you can take that to people and you can show it to them and you know they're gonna laugh at you. When we built the first version of PlantLink, everyone said, what are you doing? Nobody's gonna buy that. That's not what people want. There's all these wires. Don't do that. You have to fix all these things. And instead of taking that rejection and saying, okay, well, we're done, what we did was we improved those features and we fixed those problems. And by the time we launched on Kickstarter, we had hundreds of people that had already signed up to back us to pre-order our product because we had interacted with them already and they were really interested. And that's what a crappy prototype does for you. It gets you in front of people and has, lets you show something to people. Show and tell is not just for kindergarten. And then finally, you have to maximize your failure rate. If you're anything like me, it's gonna take you four or five times to try and build something before you get a version that you're really happy with. And along the way, you're gonna learn a lot of lessons about what it means to be successful because of all the failures that you're gonna have. And this is really different than what you're used to in high school or what you'll be used to in college. Because in those places, you know, the grades matter. You have to get in there, you have to get a grade, you have to get it right the first time. And if you fail, that's really bad. But in the real world, you wanna fail as much as possible because you learn so much more from failure than you ever will from success. And if you wanna have five successes, that means you're gonna to have to fail again and again and again and again until you get to those successes. But once you get there, it'll be so much more satisfying than it ever would have been if you'd gotten it right on the first try. So if you're not failing, it means you're not trying something that's hard enough. So that's it. Those are the four things that I think you should think about if you wanna be more innovative. Embrace distractions. Look at those problems that are coming up in your everyday life. Find some co-conspirators that you can talk to about your ideas. Make sure you're building a lot of crappy things as much as possible, and then maximize your failure rate so that you can be as successful as you want to be. And who knows, one day you might find yourself standing on this exact same stage. I'd like to thank the University of Illinois for the opportunity to win this, the Technology Entrepreneurship for uh, working with the prize, the professors I had at Baylor University who encouraged me to keep pursuing engineering, uh, my co-founders at Oso Technologies who are working on building PlantLink, the different organizations that have funded us to make our pot company a reality, and finally, most importantly, Dolly Lemelson and the Lemelson Foundation for making this entire event possible. Thank you for listening to me. I'd love to take any questions you have at this time. Oh, the area that it'll cover. So if you think about uh, taking the temperature of something with a thermometer, it's very similar to that. Uh, one thermometer might be able to tell you the temperature in one spot, and that'll be great as long as that's representative of the temperature in a large, larger area. So if you had a flower bed with lots of similar types of flowers that you water very consistently in a uniform manner, you might just need one sensor. But if you have several potted plants, you might need more, you know, multiple sensors for something like that. So it really depends on uh, you know, the actual user about how big of an area it'll cover. Yeah. If it's wireless, how, do you, uh, how long is the battery life? Have you got a charging system? 
Yeah, right now the battery life is around two years for each of the sensors. How much does one system cost? So you need a base station that they communicate back with, and the base station in one sensor is $69 right now, and then each additional sensor is 25 bucks, and the valve that we've developed is uh, $60. But that's being done with a really small batch manufacturing process that's happening locally in Illinois, so the prices are gonna go down substantially if we ever start scaling up. Yeah. Great. Is there one more, I guess? So where do you stand as far as commercialization or sort of what's your next step? It sounds like you're gonna take a year off, but do you intend to get venture capital or do you intend to sort of keep scaling up with grants or? Yeah, so right now uh, I'm gonna be taking a year off of school, focusing on the company. We have two full-time employees along with the co-founders of the company. And uh, we'll be looking for some investment at the beginning of the fall, probably in September, October timeframe. Uh, and then from there, we're gonna be working to get PlantLink into retail stores, but also to look at you know, commercial uh, growers, so people like nurseries, commercial landscaping companies have expressed a lot of interest. And then moving into you know, the emerging economies and getting into the agricultural places there, we think there's a lot of opportunity for impact with this product in those places. So that's kind of our rough roadmap for now. Yeah, great. All right, thank you so much.